one. So um, I think you've all met Kaki before. She's a digital content curator in ELA, and um, she's very kindly offered to talk to us about practices, recommendations, and explorations for, for archiving. Um, take it away, Kaki. Do you need to do your, the, the assignments before that, or are you going to? No, do no, that? we've got a class after this. Oh, all right, fair enough. Okay. They couldn't uh, get enough field method this week, so we've got oh, wonderful. six hours of So, except for Serge, the rest of you are field method students, is that right? So you've been there, uh, were you all there when I did the lecture in Julia's class? No. Uh, how many yeah. of you weren't? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. ALDD, yeah. yes. Maybe she, maybe he wasn't. Maybe he wasn't there. Maybe, maybe he was there in, in body, but no, he wasn't. There. His mind was somewhere. His mind wasn't there. <laughs> no, no. Okay, because I didn't know how many of uh, um, of you guys would have shown. So I've prepared some of these slides. So we'll skim through them very quickly because it's stuff that I've already talked about. Um, uh, so what I was hoping to cover today were things like what is an archive, which I might have talked before. Uh, the relationships of um, archiving, between archiving and, and languages and language data, and in particular endangered language data, which might be the interest of, for some of you. Uh, talk a little bit about the research data life cycle and how important it is uh, when we talk about archiving and best archiving practices to make sure that we have good data management practices in place early, early in, the, in the whole process. And finally, um, I will be going through advice uh, that per perhaps maybe um, Peter has already talked about, but uh, try and, re and uh, sort of shape them with respect to archiving and preservation recommendations. Um, and giving you a list of resources, and by all means, um, you know where we live in the archive, feel free to come in and, and ask for more. Uh, so you've seen these p pictures before. Can I start by saying what, after having had an interaction with the archive, what do you think an archive is and what do you think it does? <coughs> Shall we use Paul Newman's quote? No, use whatever quote you like. <laughs> use the cemetery. The cemetery. <laughs> graveyard. Yeah. It's a graveyard where things live. Die. <laughs> no, they don't die, they live. They're, they're, they're buried there to carry on living. So, um, all of these things can be regarded in an archive. Um, uh, an archive does things like making sure that they keep, we keep data safe, we store it for the future, preservation we call that. We provide facilities for people to access and search that data, so we call that, we call that discovery. And according to what the community, and that's in particular to relation, in relationship with uh, um, endangered language documentation and linguistic documentation and cultural data, uh, to make sure that the wishes of the communities um, involved um, and the depositors' uh, wishes are res uh, respected when it comes to access. Um, and some of the archives also have a value or a name to provide a platform for sharing data and. Um, uh, sort of uh, work as a facilitator between what the users do and what the users would like to access and what the producers or depositors are, um, are producing in terms of data. You've seen that before? So if these are all the archives we know, so that includes not necessarily digital archives but also what other archives can we have? What other archives could we have? From Apart from digital, I've asked that question again. Yeah. Books. Yeah, books, papers. Yeah. Yes, the paper archives, that's very good. Uh, digital archives are a subset of that, and the other small subset are the digital language archives. So f for digital archives, you can have other types of data, like uh, statistical data, like or government data, or economic, or, uh, or other data. And an even smaller subset of that are the endangered languages archives. So the languages archives are specialised in endangered languages. Um, so I'll just skim through this, um, and here's how they work, and you might have seen that graph, graph before. So we have producers, data producers, people who go out in the field and record data. 
What they do is they produce the data and they give it to the archive in some form or another. Or another. Uh, we will talk about what would be a recommended form for this for uh, data that comes into the archive. So the archive takes it, uh, does some work on them. We will talk a little bit further about today and in more detail about what the archive will do. Um, it links things or it takes people's already created relationships and um, includes them in what they have in their system. And what they do then is they make that available. So the files as well as the relationships as well as the, any added value they have created while working on that data. And they disseminate it to the users. So the users are the people who would like to go and look at the data, access it, do something with them or um, work, work further on them. Uh, sorry, before I move on, any questions about this picture? So far, so good. Okay. So, um, in addition to the, 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 the services or um, um, advice, or the, the, the information I, I gave in the previous slide, um, a language archive can offer help with endangered language revitalization. It's a very important role. Of, of an archive that has such material. Um, so uh, the data can be used to create usable language material for communities by either by the archive or other researchers that are accessing the archive. Um, another thing would be, uh, another thing that uh, language archives do and offer is quality and standards. So they would check the data are pro properly documented. So not any material can enter the archive, making sure that there's, they're uh, consistent, they have uh, as much information as possible. So they're in the, uh, negotiating with depositors to make sure that what comes in and what goes out is at its best shape and form. Um, and uh, advice and training, it advises depositors like I do today to you, future documenters, as well as elsewhere in other platforms organizing workshops throughout uh, the creation of that day of data uh, and it, when it comes to issues around archiving and how people can reuse their data. Um, you are a digital generation, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, why do you think it's important that data nowadays, documentation data, is digital? Or you, why you think it's not important? Why you think it's useful or not useful? Accessibility. Accessibility is one, yes. So anyone can um, listen to an MP3 or a WAV file on any machine or any, like, could be on a, a mobile phone or laptop, a tablet. Anything else? That's a very good point. It doesn't direct, and it's much easier to migrate into um, newer formats as well. So, because a format might become obsolete, but it is much easier, as you say, to, to move it into future formats. So, here are some of my thoughts. One of the best ways we have to, that media um, can be preserved for the future, it can be copied and transmitted with zero, lo uh, uh, zero loss. Uh, it's all. It's much, much easier to catalogue, share, disseminate, as well as store. Because imag imagine um, a huge library, loads of manuscripts and books, and how many um, like book bookshelves and how much space you need to store all these manuscripts. And now think the equivalent into the digital world and how much less space it occupies. Um, and as, um, as was mentioned, you can access anything, anywhere, anytime, or, or anything. Um, and users of language archives are, of course, the communities, um, um, depositors, people like yourselves in the future, creating data, wanting to go back and access more, uh, or I'll add to it, because they might have gone um, again to the field and done a second round, or. Um, other researchers, comparative historical uh, linguists, again people like yourselves, but coming from the researcher point of view or the user point of view, um, and other people like say, um, educationalists or generalists in the wider public. Um, and why uh, you think language archiving is different? I mean, having 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 worked with Peter throughout your film methods course and having looked at some of the audio training and some of the material hopefully that the archive has, 
why would you think that language archiving is different? What are the issues that are special to what we are doing? Yes. Um, it's very important for language archiving to have um, metadata mm -hmm. accompanying it, accompanying any recording, because mm -hmm. otherwise it might be very difficult to establish and actually understand the value mm -hmm. of a particular recording, mm -hmm. particular piece of audio, video material. That's a very good point, but do you think that that's specific to endangered or language material? I think it's more so specific to endangered languages right. rather than any other kind of data mm -hmm. or any kind of uh, archives. I mean, yeah, it's important to have metadata accompanying any kind of, but especially when it comes to endangered languages where we might never get a chance to record that particular language ever again. That's a very good point. To know what it is and ha you know, what it's about somehow. That's a very good point. So going to the field and recording a speaker who might be the last speaker of that language um, carries a, lo a lot of responsibility for whoever goes there, both for the depositor as well as for the archive, mm -hmm. because that material is somebody's heritage, somebody's life story. Um, it's not numbers. So um, other thoughts are what do we mean by language? Is something a language? Is, 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 uh, um, um, it's not something, but um, is, is, is words, words that somebody speaks, are they a language, are they dialect, are they just words? Um, um, what, are the, what is the context? What is the story they carry with them? Um, um, another issue, another in interesting thing is that data is not just TXT files. So you have a greater variety of formats that you need to know how to work with. Uh, your colleagues in the economic department, economics department, or your colleagues in the government, government department, they will not probably look at video data or audio data. So they will probably not worry at all about how to handle it. But yourselves, you will be able to you, you will have to record as part of your documentation, audio, video, do the annotation. You'll have a much greater variety of data to work with, so you will need the skills to be able to do that. Um, of course, large file sizes and greater variety of data formats, diversity, as we mentioned before, um, and the sensitivities and restrictions that um, endangered language documentation carries. And of course, as we said, extremely high priority. Um, so, I think there's something special about endangered languages <clears throat> in that they're typically um, having their domains of use restricted, mm -hmm. often to very domestic, personal kinds of contexts, and that ties in. So sensitivities might be, um, you know, the cultural restrictions or whatever, but they're also sensitivities that come about in a sense because of the nature that the, the language domains are, are contracting and yeah. so the kinds of content that you're going to be getting, not just the form but also mm. the content, sure. yeah. is particular and has to be dealt with in a particular fashion. Yeah, and, and absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, the, the word sensitivity is a very generic term mm. as well, so depending on the culture or the community or the individuals you'll work with, you'll, you'll come across different um, experiences and different perceptions of what, sens what sensitivity is. And that links very much to um, issues around consent and informed consent and access and who can access and what they can access. Uh, There's also another kind of point which is um, often the number of speakers or the number of people who are competent in an endangered language is very different from what you get language. So what that means, if we're talking about preserving material so that other people can use it, future generations or whatever, if you preserve material in English or Polish or Russian, then anybody who speaks English or Polish or Russian potentially mm -hmm. could access it and make use of it and be multi-purpose and blah, blah, blah. But if the recordings are only in a language that a handful of people can translate and help transcribe, then it has a very different status from, say, a conversation that was recorded. So I, I think that's peculiar to endangered materials, that the notion of preservation yeah. is a very different one if what you're preserving 
mm. is something that anybody would be able to annotate or transcribe or translate. I'll add it to that. That's a very good point. Thank you. I'll add it to the list. Um, and also it makes the metadata business really important, much more important than, you know, than everything else. Um, any more thoughts or comments on, on this? Yes? Compared to other language archiving, you, sometimes with endangered languages you can't afford to be as fussy as you could if you were trying to talk in English. So say there are only a few speakers left and none of them have any teeth. You want mm -hmm. to find someone who gives you a great idea of the technology of the language, but you just sort of accept that. So sometimes it might be more restricted for that reason. That's a very good point. So you have to work with whatever you have, really, rather than being... Um, um, so you don't have the luxury, let's say, to uh, to um, look into... So if it's the, the last remaining speaker, the last few remaining speakers, you need to make the most out of what you have in front of you, what you can work with. Wonderful point. Thank you. Anything else? I'll move on... Um, I'll skim through this. You can have a slide if you want to look at what other archives are doing. Um, I'm just, uh, I've just given you some examples of a variety of different types of archives. So you can have local as well as um, international. You can have uh, um, archives attached to a research institute. You can have um, physical versus digital versus mixed and so on and so forth. Um, I'll skim through that as well because I've, you probably have seen that um, um, either in, in Peter's or in, in, in other lectures. So I'll, I've had it there so that I didn't know how much. Um, but you can have a look at these pictures. So these are some of our data providers and some of the um, speaker communities, uh, community members, not the whole communities. Um, and this is who we are, who I will also, which I will also skim through because I'm sure you've already heard about who we are and what we do. Um, we are a digital endangered languages archive, in case you're still doubting in doubt of that. And we do all these things we mentioned um, a while ago. And here is the breakdown of the types of data we have. And that's what our portal looks like. Um, I would, um, it would be um, um, the section that will be useful, very useful f for the, like the, my talk today is this, the, the section called using, um, sorry, depositing. So all the information I'm giving you in bullet point form is uh, like the, the whole page is explaining to you what uh, um, our, our recommendations to our depositors. And you've seen that, and you've seen that. And you've hopefully all registered by now. If not, I've made some printouts of the guide if you need to. And um, you have heard about our protocol. Would it be worth asking what each of the letters mean? Because uh, we've spoken about this before. So what does you mean? Universal? You, all users, yes. That's, that's very close. Not universal, though. It's all registered users. All right. It's universal, but yet for well, registered users, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, what about R? <laughs> researcher. Yes, yeah, so people who have registered and who we know that are researchers, either independent researchers or um, in an institution. C? Approved researchers. Approved researchers. Yep. Mm -hmm. and that status, yes. So they don't get that automatically. They have to apply for it and we check. Um, C. It's up there. <laughs> yes, somebody said it. Members of the community. Members, members of the community, speaker <coughs> community, that the depositor has uh, individually approved. So they have to apply to the depositor, and the depositor will approve them. And what about S, which is our last category? Subscriber, Subscriber which means. True, they're registered users who they've applied for access to that particular deposit and the depositor has approved, has approved them. And we go to the important bits for today. Um, so, um, as I said, all the good data management 
issues and practices that Peter's talked about in the past. So um, also are vital for good good archi uh, good practices for archiving. So if you follow good data management practice, then your data will be very easily to archive at the end of it. Um, so how uh, so for example, things you could do that you should do as part of your data management for your uh, data during your um, project would be to document decisions, why you use that file uh, naming and not the other, have you changed it, say somewhere that today, the 29th, I've decided to change my file naming system as follows, and I've only changed this folder and not everything else, because you probably will not remember it in two or three months' time. Uh, document steps, document your conventions when you're annotating things, document your structures, document your encodings, document your formats if it's video or audio files. Um, make sure you have, uh, you are following appropriate and conventional data encoding methods and that might sound like Greek to you, but, or to some of you because some of you know Greek, but that actually means make sure that uh, your characters are Unicode. They are a particular format that can be read uh, forever. This is like the preservation format. Uh, be explicit and consistent. Consistency is very important. Plan for what you're going to do, how you're going to export <coughs> some uh, file from an editor or from software, and how you're going to put it into another. Uh, and as, as I said, good data management practices is, means good and easier archiving for the future. Um, what is data management? Have you, you've covered that, haven't you? But can I, somebody remind me what data management is? What is data? What do we mean by data? Yeah, but you know, no, it's fine, it's fine. Just, 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 just let the idea flow in. What, what is an opinion? What, what could data be? Let's not make the, the question... Come on, Eleanor, you Come on. on this. <laughs> so data is information mm -hmm. put together for a particular purpose. Is that what we decided in here? That's a good definition. Other ideas about what data is? It might help if you talk to them, talk about data in, in terms of um, what the purpose is, perhaps. That might be easier to define. Yes, Nana. Audio recordings and mm -hmm. video These are all types of yes, data, yes. yes, that's wonderful. From the field. Wonderful. So what does data management mean? Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Making sure that it's used and recorded and stored efficiently. Good. Well done. Somebody else? I'm going to start shouting now because you're falling asleep. <laughs> Anything else? When you work with data, like you went for your audio training, right? You went out and did recordings. You grabbed a recording and did recordings. What were the things that went wrong? Everything went perfectly fine. Everything went wrong. What about these? Y yes, Nana. Yes. Uh, so data management includes uh, noting down the name of the recording, the time, and other things, and then identifying the files of all this mm -hmm. that you put them in and then trying to be consistent with uh, putting them in the particular place that you plan to put them on. Wonderful. So making sure that the links are there, you have metadata, and you've recorded the right information for what you've done to them. So that's an instance of data management. Um, it actually covers everything from the moment you grab your recorder and create a file to the moment to, to, to the point where you will actually uh, do what you want to do with it, edit it, annotate it, and leave it on one side to rest before you archive it. 
So um, it is it is something that you probably have done without even knowing. Uh, for example, when you create a document file for your assignments, right? How do you do that? Do you work on the same copy throughout the three weeks before the assignment, or do you make three weeks, two days? Well, whatever. <laughs> so, or do you make, or do you make multiple copies that you name in a different way? So, how do you work when you, when you work with a document like that? Okay, the assignment that you did for Peter, the recent assignment you did for Peter, how many files, different files, versions of that file did you have? One. One. Two, good. Two. Two. Stored on the same computer? No. No? In another computer? In a pen drive. And only in a pen drive? No. In a computer and, and the pen drive. Good, I like that. Anything else? Computer and Dropbox. Computer and Dropbox. Yeah, computer. That's good. <laughs> There's another copy somewhere else. Did you print a copy out? Oh, yeah. you, you, submitted one. One. you submitted one. Okay. So these are all instances of data management. It doesn't have to apply to an audio or a video file. You're doing it every day. When you move your WAV file, your favorite music and you convert it to an mp3 so that it's light and you can play it on your mp3 player that's an instance of data management because you're converting to alternative formats I'm just trying to show you how how, you, how often you're actually doing it because you we're, we're dealing with digital data every day without even no, noticing uh, for those of you who are interested um, 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 perhaps Serge might be interested in the last bullet point um, so, uh, data management plans is uh, an outline of the good data management practices you promise to follow throughout your project. And this might not be a requirement for you guys for your assignment. It might not be for you either. Even for you, no, it's not right. But it, it is a good, it's a good resource to go and have a look because it gives you uh, what uh, um, 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 large grant funding agencies like ESRC, Research Council UK, the NSF in the States, what they recommend as a good data management uh, practice. So it's a, good, it's a questionnaire that you have to answer about your project. So it's a good place to go and see whether what you've done already or whether you've thought about all the different aspects of data management. And these are guys are sort of experts, they've got very large archives, and so they, they up, update these data management plans quite often. This is exactly what we're doing straight after. Oh, the oh right, okay. We actually need to develop. We've discovered now we have so many hundreds of files all over the place, we actually need a data management plan. So that link could be useful um, or not. So you should worry about managing your data because it makes your own research easier. It protects your valuable data. Better quality and research data and without any loss is, means better research. And it enhances your research visibility, which means that if your data is out there and it's accessible uh, in a nice format, people have more chances of using it, rather than if it was in a proprietary format that no one could open. And compliance, ensures compliance with ethical codes, data protection and other laws. And of course, easier archiving is at the end of all this. Um, and the most important point out of all these is the first one. You need to remember that the data you create especially when it comes to endangered language documentation, they will have a lo much longer, hopefully, lifespan than yourselves. Uh, and they're, much more, they're likely to be used by community members in the future to be able to look at what their language sounded like or uh, how, what their, their rituals were like in, in, uh, in the past. So uh, think of it in that context as well while you're doing all that hard work. So it might sound or seem tedious, but if you think of it in that larger context, it makes it, makes it all worthwhile. Um, um, and you've probably heard about all these things already. So things to consider would be what type of data you will generate during your research, uh, ethical and legal issues, copyright, data storage, backup is very important. 
consistent file and folder management and in the case where you have more than one researcher, how do you manage that? Now, how many of you are part of the Selective project? Right, quite a few of you. So, uh, what I would like, not just you guys, but everybody, uh, I have a question at the end of the whole thing is, how many of these things we're going to talk about today apply or are the same or are different when it comes to the context of working with a larger group of people? Um, so, I'll ask it at the end. It's also true in the field methods class, yep. because everybody's working together and sharing. So all, of this is a so all of you have had some, some sort of experience in group work. So keep it as a question in the back of your mind while we're talking about all these issues and, and see what are, the, are, the, are all these issues common? Are there any differences? Are there any additional issues that perhaps you've come across and you would like to ask me about? Um, and they know about that already, right? We've discussed it. So I will just not do work about it. So what this is, is how from the point of creating data, what are the steps? Uh, so you process them, you analyze them, you preserve them, you give access to somebody or more people, hopefully somebody uses it and then creates some new data and then the cycle starts over again. So I'll, I'll skim through all this information. I'll have the slides if you need to have a look at them. Let me just, it's easier that way. So when preparing your documentation for archiving, here are the things we're, we're going to, I'm going to sort of go into, sorry, go into further details. So talk about file naming and folders with, with respect to archiving now, because of course, as, as we said, um, you've, you've received already some um, guidance on data management on that. So <clears throat> what do you remember from your data management class? when it comes to data file naming and organization? What were the good things to do? What were the bad things to do? Being consistent, Being consistent is very important, yes? Trying to input too much metadata into the file name. Yes. It's not, it's not, good. It's not a good thing. That's very, very important. So consistency in documentation is, I think, to me, the top most things to do. And then the um, uh, semantics is a third one in importance. Anything else? So have you seen that example before? You need to be careful about what characters are in. Yes, yes, that's very, very correct. So that goes back to what we talked about um, non-UTFA characters, so a script that perhaps your computer, you can see on your computer, like Chinese characters or Tibetan characters or Greek characters, that do not actually show up properly in other systems. Mm, dashes are okay. No, it's fine. Dashes and underscores are fine. Spaces are not a very good practice, especially double spaces. <laughs> Because, I mean, a single space does not confuse this, a computer that much or a, or a system that much, but a double space, some, some systems cannot understand two of them. So they will interpret as one, which means that it actually, there is a file with two spaces in it that you cannot open or you cannot do anything with. You, can only, you might be able to rename it, but not necessarily. So by just having a look at this file, what are the information you can gather? Yes, it's that bit perhaps. Yeah. August. Yeah. Two thousand eleven. Yep. Might be a narrative or something like that. That's you could, that's from this one, I guess. It's an audio file. You can, you can tell from the WAV file. Uncompressed, yeah. Well, you wouldn't know because maybe somebody has renamed it. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, but but it, chances are chances are that it's it's probably a, a, yeah it's pro probably a sorry <laughs> sorry it's where it's where the the, um, the archivist kicks in. But what about this one? What could this be? Yeah, 
Say that again. Oh, I said it could be a language. Yes, it could be a language. It could be a language. Yeah, we don't know. Could be a language. Consultant's name. Consultant's name, initials, beginning or linguist name. Okay, we don't know. So, for this particular example, that's what the person, that's the, the convention that the person followed. But you, you realize how important it is to have that written somewhere because chances are maybe a member of your team won't know what conventions you used. Um, and the speaker ID was formulated in that particular example by taking the initials of the speaker. But. Um, it's weird. B E S for Betsy and the Spinoza. That's true. Betsy Elizabeth Spinoza. So maybe it's B E from Betsy and Spinoza from S. Maybe. I don't know. I, I, stole, I stole that example from somebody else, from, from David's slides. So. Okay. Any questions on that? You, you are happy with this. You are familiar with that. So all the guidance you've received for your uh, data management and files applies to data management, to archiving and files. So um, document your standard formats wherever possible. Uh, if you have information or somatic information in, in the file name, put them in the same order all over your, your wherever you use it, put it in the same order. and. Uh, uh, keep them simple and consistent. It's very, very important. Um, do not use spaces, use hash, uh, dashes or underscores. UTF-8 is important. Some people might say uh, ASCII only, but because you wouldn't know if it's UTF-8 or not, but um, UTF-8 is good. Make sure all files have an extension. We get loads of files in the archive that don't have an extension, especially from Mac users. Um, just it's just a nightmare because you have to get to sort of try and name, rename it and try and find out what uh, file it is or run it through some software to tell you what kind of file type it is. Uh, avoid double dots and do not forget to record information about the files and their relationships. So I have <laughs> some examples of different folders just to show you what people, uh, depositors, are following in terms of their folder structure. Any of this is possible so long as it's consistent, documented, and follows the uh, rules for file naming uh, that we mentioned before. So here it is, this person, what have they done? They've got, can you see the, the letters? It's very small. So they have their ELAN files together and the media files together. Their ELAN files look like this. The uh, media files look like this. So what they've done is they followed, they, they've named the same, the related files with the same file name. Um, another example, this person has chosen to uh, group things by um, session. So within the same folder, they've put all the related information, the picture, um, the audio file, um, the annotation, and any um, preference files. Uh, another example is uh, just listing everything in the same folder, so no, no folder structure at all. And they've used the file naming to group things and then their metadata will, will tell us what links with what and additional information. So, um, and here's another example where the, the same collection had loads of languages and they've first grouped everything by language and then they've uh, given us the, the dictionary. Right? Any questions? I'll move on quickly to... Um, um, oh, I can give you... Um, I don't know if you've come across any of this software. We use them in the archive to manipulate data, uh, file, 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 file names and folders and structures. So I've included them there just in case at some point you need to do the same uh, as a possible program software to use. Um, I'm not affiliated with any of these people <laughs> or any of these software. It's just the ones that I've found uh, easy to use and I'm sort of telling you what they are. Um, the other point is, when it comes, to, especially when it comes to software, uh, make sure that when you start your project, for example, you create uh, documents in .doc 
extension. And in five years' time, Microsoft decides that I'm going to forget, I'm not going to use a dot doc extension anymore, I'm going to use a dot doc x extension. So make sure that you keep up with the latest updates or versions of its software uh, and make sure that you migrate to the appropriate. Or use my advice and convert everything to preservation friendly formats and make, you know, that, then you won't have any trouble. Um, so, um, you, have you come across this um, distinction of different types of formats, for, for file formats that you will have during your project lifecycle? So, you'll start with the original, you'll produce some derivative or some working format of that, either because you will need to edit it or cut it, trim it, or group it with something else. Then you'll have the final copy that will be the one ready for preservation. Are you familiar with these terms, or should I go into more, more detail? Should I, should, do you want to go over them? Okay, so when you did your audio training, you created an audio file, and that was just what the machine named as sequential .wav files. Um, and that's your original, so the native format as you get it from the recording device. Now, I don't know if you did anything with these files, but if you were doing this as fieldwork documentation, the idea would be that you would produce different versions of that WAV file, either because you would select um, a part of it to include in your analysis or because you would group something with something else and present it as, a, as a same, uh, the same file to further annotate it. So that's your working version. You can have multiple, more than one working versions of the same file, but you will only have one original. You need to make sure you, you keep that original and be able to go back to it just in case something happens. Um, and for your working versions also, make sure you have the one that looks best. So if you were working on trimming it, have the trimmed version somewhere kept safe and then carry on on doing more work on it. Um, and finally, the preservation copy is the copy that um, usually the archive will get, but it will be the, uh, your best version of your working copy in a converted in a preservation friendly format. And I'm going to talk about preservation friendly formats in a minute. Okay. Yeah? Ask you, mm. you said the native format of the file extracted from the recording device, but that doesn't necessarily mean the name is assigned on the recording device, is that right? No. So the original, you could still have an original that you had renamed, for example? Yes. Yes. Um, it will depend on what you are doing and how your workflow um, is set up, as in how, how you would like to work with your data. So you might choose to, to um, back up somewhere safely the original as an original, because for some reason uh, you wanted to have a record or you wanted to uh, have files as they were without being renamed. Equally, you could rename it and then make a note of the association. So. Um, STE 00001.wav was renamed to um, 2013.11.29-kc-01.wav and was placed in that folder. So you can, you can keep track of your changes in different ways depending on how your workflow is set up. So after this, let's think about what are we doing in the field now. Any more questions about the three different types? You, would you expect um, the files that you get in the archives, mm -hmm. would you already expect it to be in preservation uh, format, mm -hmm. file name? Whether you do it, you don't, it's one question. And mm -hmm. also another question, what percentage actually is in that format that you get? I don't. I wouldn't be able to report on the percentage, but but okay. So uh, depending depending on the type of file, we have different policies. So um, uh, 
so your text files uh, we normally keep the original that is given to us and we make a preservation copy for those of them that are not in, not in the right format um, and um, I'm going to go into detail as to what we do for each file for each format sorry uh, now I don't know I don't have stats about what percentage of data that comes in I don't I mean we get we get we get people who are very well informed and uh, have, have worked really hard on the collection and have got the original as well as the preservation copy in which case so that means very little work for us in the, on, on that front but equally we get people who just give us the originals and they say you know here it is and we work on it and produce the preservation friendly formats I can work on it and, and you know, report back but I don't have the stats in my, my mind I'm afraid today so uh, but it's an interesting question interesting question um, so this is an overview of the different types of data that, as an archive, we um, usually come across. Um, so we have audio files, of course, video files, text files, annotations in various uh, software uh, formats. Uh, most of the linguistic packages are good in terms of, so they're, they, they have an HTML export option or they are already um, um, preservation friendly. So that sort of is good in a way. Uh, images and structured data such as databases, uh, spreadsheets, um, and, and other, other relational um, uh, data. So for audio files, the, 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 it's kind of, um, it's pretty stable in the, in the, in the field, uh, not your field, in the archiving field. Um, uh, that uh, we, you the preservation friendly, the best format, the recommended format is a, uh, for audios, uh, audio files is a, a WAV file, a full resolution WAV file, so lossless compression. Uh, with settings, recording with settings of 44.1 kilohertz, you've heard about that before, 16-bit um, stereo, unless there is a special reason why it shouldn't be stereo, it should be mono. Um, some people do specialised uh, recordings of prostate information where they have to use mono one on one. Uh, they have to use two channels to record something. So, but unless unless there's a particular reason, it's stereo. I think is that is that right? Yeah. What is the original is mono? Is there any reason for duplicating the channel and making it stereo? Do you remember what? Uh, Tom mentioned in the audio training. I think maybe he talked about that slightly. He he was when we were listening to the mono and stereo. He was saying that the mono, if the mono is the original, then um, we might want to have a, a, a input it into Audacity and produce a stereo for the sake of our listeners, you know, listening on both ears rather than on one ear. I don't know. I think I think no. Mono files will be when you play them. You will listen to them on one ear. Is that what you're asking? Can you ask the question again? The first question? Ask the first question. Yes, please. Is there any reason for duplicating the channel and making a stereo? And if it sounds only one year, mm -hmm. then it makes sense. For the archiving purposes, there is no there is no reason to make a stereo out. If your original is a mono, we we don't recommend for you to turn it into a stereo. So that's that part of the question. Now, the second part of the question is: Should us documenters produce a stereo? If our recording is in mono, should we do? A stereo, or should we should we create a stereo version of that file? Is that is that right? Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm asking that because hmm? I have an opinion. I don't think it's right. Hmm. Because have a stereo, don't you think that? Oh, you're you're, you're expecting stereo information. Mm hmm. But it's not there. It's just duplicated more. Mm hmm. So nothing is quite fair. Mm hmm. Because the, the future uses in that file. That's true. So the only the only reason I think that so from an, from the archives point of view, if your original is a mono web file, 
then that's the original. That's what you deposit. You don't, if you produce a, a stereo derivative, it's a derivative. It's not the original. Now, the reason why, as, a, as, as Tom had mentioned, you might want to create one, uh, so you will keep your original, but you might want to create a stereo. I think what he had mentioned was just for the sake of your listeners or your, the people who listen to that recording. Of course, it won't be stereo information, but it might be more pleasant if they listen to one. Yes, if on two had, eyes. If you had a mix of recordings in a derived product, yeah. for example, a talking dictionary, mm -hmm. and some were stereo and some were mono, yeah. that would drive your listeners crazy. Um, so what you might do is, if you want to use the mono ones, is to do the duplication and everything then right. would be stereo. Some would be original stereo and some would be derived stereo. But it, for listenability in such a context, it makes sense to have everything coming through both ears. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So, but, but from the archivist's point of view, the archive's point of view, if your original is a mono, we want the, the mono. So, uh, if, if you have it, because some people destroy it. Any other? Yeah? Sorry, no, no, please, please, please do. Um, is, it, is it a good idea to use um, uh, lo some kind of lossless compression, like black? Or lossless, yeah, well, WAV is a lossless compression. It's a lossless. Yeah, but there's also black. Like yes, there is, yes, there is. Well, is it generally. Um, I am not sure about the recommendation for flag. Because I know that it's a loss less, but that's that occupies loss um, less space. But the issue with flax, as far as I understand, is that not everybody um, perceives them as being as good quality as as lossless as web files. So um, I don't. I will need. I will need to look into that to, to give you proper advice. But I don't. I don't know the answer to that. But my my from my um, very little knowledge about audio, um, um, that's what I know. But we perhaps that would be a question we can we can ask Tom, uh, because he's the one who knows a lot more about it than myself. But the reason why I know I know for sure that from the, for the uh, when it comes to archiving, that uh, FLAC doesn't have the same status as WAV files. So WAV files is, is is taken by everybody to be the best. But FLAC is fairly recent. It's a, an open format, uh, but it hasn't received as much um, appreciation as as WAV files for that for that reason. How much time do I have? Do you normally get a break in between? It's up to you if you want to. Um, would it be okay if I go over the audio slide and then we can break for five, five minutes, ten minutes? And then you can come back, hopefully. Um, any more questions about that? So, video, um, I don't have recommendations on video. No one in the field has recommendations on video. Um, it's not a very stable. It's not stable yet when it comes to advice. So advice about what's best preservation-friendly format changes every year uh, as new formats come in. Um, text is very stable. It's text .txt tab delimited C, comma separated files or PDF A1, uh, PDF A1 B or A if it's uh, some uh, if it's documents that. Um, have uh, formatting information that you need to preserve. Uh, as I said, annotation files uh, will uh, depend on the software provided that's readable by an editor. So most of the, so Elan, Toolbox, uh, Flex, what else are you using? Transcriber, uh, they all output or can export in XML or their the, the formats are already, so the format in which they save the files are already pre preservation friendly because you can open them with an editor and you can read the, the content. Um, images, uh, JPEG and TIFF. TIFF is the best preservation friendly format but it's the one that occupies more space. Uh, so it's good for scans and uh, scanning old manuscripts and old books. JPEGs is usually the format that we get images, like from digital cameras. If you're scanning, <coughs> excuse me, if you're scanning, make sure your resolution is 3, 
100 dpi or better. If you want to scan something, you don't know what I'm talking about, come to the archive and ask us. Um, uh, some people have uh, um, scanned uh, field notebooks that they've handwritten and they've, they've done it in the lowest resolution and they're not very good. They're useless in the sense that we could have had the same information much better uh, scanning quality, especially with the scanning equipment we have nowadays. Uh, structured data, um, spreadsheets, databases, uh, we, um, we encourage people to give it to, that, to us in the format that they've created it. Uh, but, uh, so always keep the original, uh, but we normally, when we get it exported in, so the tables, if it's a database, into a CSV uh, or a tab delimited format, um, spreadsheets, if they've got colours and other information that cannot be preserved, otherwise we also create, in addition to CSVs, we create PDFs. So, um, again, we, we talk to depositors and, of course, when time comes and you need to archive with us or another archive, it would be good to get into conversation with them to see what they, their recommendation would be. So, I will stop now. Let's get started. <laughs> Okay. Um, um, Peter explained to me that after this lecture, you're going to be working on in more detail in some actual data that you've done with. Is that with with uh, you've done the recordings? So. Um, I would like you to interrupt me from now on because all of the things that I'm going to talk about are practical things. Interrupt me and ask questions, thinking about what you will be doing in the next few hours before the film night. Um, okay, so looking at audio files, um, we've talked about, uh, um, so these settings should be settings that you set on, on your recorder. If for some reason you've made a mistake, keep the original. Do not destroy the original um, before you. So, and then you might want to do, um, change it from an .mp3 to a .wav file. Um, you shouldn't really, but let's say you decide for some reason to do so. But always keep your original, regardless of the state of it. Um, remember your audio training. Go back to your notes, go back to your experiences and see what, was the, what were the things that I, I listened for, or what were the things, yep? I'm sorry, I just have a, on the settings, and then, because more and more recorders are actually offering higher resolution settings. Mm-hmm. Do we stick to 44.1 and 16? I don't know. Do they offer 96? I don't know. Uh, could we, could somebody make a note and ask, let's ask Tom. Yes. I, I, so it would be high resolution, but you wouldn't be able to listen to the difference, right? Right. So exactly. So they might be heavier files with not much information that were sort of not really the original because the recorder hasn't digitally manipulated some aspect of it, perhaps. But can somebody make a note and let's ask Tom what he thinks about it? Because I don't know the answer to that question. And it might, might be useful for everyone to find out what the answer is. Um, going back to the discussion about different formats, originals and working formats. Once you have your original and then you make a copy and start working on producing your um, working format, your derivative format. Feel free to edit, trim, and join as appropriate. If there is a silence in the beginning where you were trying to sort out how the machine was working, how the recorder was working, if there is a laughs or coughs or a discussion you don't want included because it's not part of what you would like to include, um, feel free to trim it out. 
Keep your original though, because sometimes maybe that discussion in the beginning is useful. Maybe it becomes data in the future. That's why keeping your original is very important. Um, be selective, so select the bits that are the ones that you're interested in working in for some purpose. And of course, think of the potential of this audio file being used by the community and other researchers. So, um, um, if you are working on, I have, um, we're, we're working on a, on a large collection recently. Um, that looks at works. On, so it was data on nasalization, very specific, very detailed, very focused. Uh, so produce that as derivative, but keep the originals just in case for some reason somebody else would like to look at another aspect of your recordings. Um, do not apply any filters, effects or noise reduction to any audio um, to the original. Um, the archiving as well, the, the copy we would like in the archive, we would like it to be without any of these filters. You might want to apply them if you want to do something with them. So for example you might want to be able to transcribe them, in which case you might want to enhance them or um, uh, raise, uh, slow them down or do other work on them. So that's why it's worth keeping multiple versions uh, of that. And of course multiple versions come with a challenge of its own on how to manage the multiple versions and that's another discussion that we perhaps could have. If you made a mistake or if the recorder that you used recorded an, an mp3 do not destroy the mp3s convert do not so you 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 would convert them to mp some some people would convert them to, to dot wav files to hide their mistake and destroy the mp3s don't do that give the mp3s to the archive it's fine we would rather have the original rather than a bad converted or manipulated file if you see what i mean and of course, for any decision you make when it comes to converting or uh, trimming or joining data, always make a note of what it was before, how it ended up being, and how the process. So you had a file called 1 and a file called 2, and you joined them, and you renamed it into Kaki C. So make a record of that so that you remember that the corresponding files to your Kaki C file were files one and two. So it's, it's, it's for your sanity in the future. You do it once and then it's, it's a record there and it's help, it stays with you for life. Um, and that's a recommendation for the archive. So if you deposit digitized material, include information of how this was done. I will at some point find out the best angle for this microphone so that I can hear myself. But it's fine at some point. Any questions with, this, with regard to the audio files? Are you all happy? So we need to ask Tom about the um, higher frequency and we need to talk to ask him about the FLAC files. Right, so make a note and let's ask him. Uh, preparing your video files. Now, I, I said that for audio files things were pretty stable and mm, people would very much agree on uh, what formats were the best. But for video files it's still something that is under discuss discussion and debate. So two years ago the best uh, recommendation was MPEG-2. Now it's no longer a recommendation. People do not like it. They go for different ones and they change. So that's why, uh, I mean, we, we, we asked um, the Joint Information Systems Committee, which is the biggest um, archiving organization in the UK, otherwise known as JISC, maybe you know it. So their recommendation was keep your originals, whatever these originals are, are they .mts? Are they .mpeg? Are they .mov? So the, the, the native original that your camera records in and then produce uh, converted uh, versions of that into different formats depending on the best practice every year, let's say. So that, that was that was that was the route. So you, you see the importance of keeping the original because the easiest way to, mi to migrate would be not from a um, a derivative but from the actual original file. So um, 
You need to make sure that you archive the most appropriate quality for what you collect. So um, the difficult thing about this is that the, you need to make a judgment as to what is the appropriate quality and what is the genre. So um, it depends on what the video, what, what, you, what you're shooting really. So is the video a, um, a picture or um, a film about um, a landscape? Yes. And there are some people doing something in the middle, perhaps. Now, would you need a very high definition or a very high detail for that? This is a question I can't answer. It will depend on what you want to do with it in the future. So you have to think about it and judge based, based on, on that. Um, format. As I said, whatever the, the source, MPEG-4, um, uh, H.264 or MTS, um, keep the original um, and um, have a, a working format uh, for... So, for example, um, when it comes to Elan, if you want to annotate a video file in Elan, it won't like very large files. So there are limitations when it comes to software. So what you would do is you would keep your original, create a, a derivative working format that's m a compressed quality and work and annotate that. And I'm going to, to talk about when, what, what you should do, or what we recommend you do when it comes to these products and archiving. Again, as with audio files, edit, trim, and join as appropriate, and be selective. Think of, the, think of the things that are useful. Do not include shots of the ground unless it's necessary. So suppose there was a mistake in the beginning, and you do this with the camera, and then you do that. Right? Do not include the soil thing unless it's necessary for some reason uh, to include it, unless you were actually shooting, shooting the grass. Um, and do not forget to recall metadata about aspects of the video, such as what equipment you used. Uh, was it on a tripod? Was it somebody holding it? Who was holding it? Uh, codex. What was, the, what was the, the original uh, file codec? What was the, the one you, you derived? What was the working format codec? Um, what software you used to convert it? It's fairly important with video files because not, not all software convert in an equally good way. Um, and of course, the relationship with other video files and other, and other audio files, just in case you extracted the video, the audio file from that video, uh, and other and other annotations. So far, so good. Any questions? Are you dealing with video files in what comes after this lecture? Just audio files. Next time you're going to do so. Um, now, this is a very interesting uh, question that we've had at the archive that we have had to make a decision or have a policy on. And that was people um, more and more use video cameras, HD cameras, and they are very high quality videos that we get. Uh, and there are issues about space now and how many different copies of the same video files you would keep. So, um, the, the policy of the recommendation we are currently giving out is we would like your original file and we would also like, uh, suppose you created any derivative files, any derivative video files that you worked upon by creating an annotation. So you've annotated a video file, an, an MPEG uh, using, uh, or an MP4 using Elan, uh, and you've time aligned your annotation onto that particular file. We want that too. So you'll have your original, and then you'll have, within your working formats, you will have other, not originals, but versions that will be your master copies, let's say, for the different uses. Suppose you want to create a film, because you're a filmmaker and you would like to show a high-definition uh, film to the community, then there might be another a master copy of, uh, of your original that you have edited, trimmed, selected, but that is of higher quality and is in a different format than, than the one you put into Elan to annotate. Does that make sense? Right. I mean, of course, it's all theoretical now unless you actually do some work and get your hands dirty, but just keep it in mind next time you do, um, next time you work on video files, that these might be issues that you'll come across. 
Um, so we say, as I said, the archive object would be the working file most closely associated with the research goal or method. So you'll have a master copy of that working uh, file. Um, and um, if you were sending us data, us meaning ELA, we um, would rather have them as files rather than DVDs because some people might burn um, DVDs to give to the community. So it's fairly hard to extract um, menus and everything from that structure unless you produce a huge ISO uh, that people can download and burn. So um, we'd rather have your audio, sorry, your video files, your, 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 your um, digital files. Um, and as I said, include as much information as you can and the, the important thing about this is that you record that information at the point when you create it, if you can, um, because otherwise you'll forget. Um, don't worry about the last point. Um, it's, out, it's again, when, if and when you would be depositing something with our particular archive. And of course, depending on who or where you give your data, uh, to, uh, there will be different um, requirements, so it might be best to check with the individual archive you would like to give your data to, to see what uh, limitations or restrictions apply. I think I'm done. Um, any questions for the video files? How many of you have worked on annotating an audio file? And what software have you used? Ilan? Anything else? Any phonologists or phoneticians? Prat? Transcriber? Toolbox? Flex? Not toolbox yet. Flex? Not play. Next term. Sorry. Spoilers. Um, so, um, most of them that we mentioned and perhaps uh, some others that I've missed. Uh, you can either export in a XML or text format that's good for preservation uh, via the export um, menu uh, item. Um, the rest are so elan.eaf files or dot to, um, dot, uh, is it dot tip files for the tool TRS. No, not for the toolbox. Oh, no, they're just TXT. It's a, it's TXT. Uh, so uh, tr uh, uh, toolbox and transcriber.trs files and Pratt files, pretty much the Pratt files nowadays, not the old version ones, they are pretty uh, good as they are, so you don't have to do any work on them. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea, people might give us uh, their video files or their audio files first, and then what follows is um, they work on the transcriptions and as they work on the transcriptions they give us the data so um, it's not unheard of people depositing um, their data in, in installments um, and we encourage people and I think it's a good recommendation for you as well while, while working on your data um, for the files, WAV files, audio files or video files that you haven't yet annotated to write, sit down and write a short description of what is being talked about because um, it might be, um, it will be useful for other people that, um, and it will be useful for yourselves to know what information is included in that file without actually having to listen to it every time even though you haven't worked on annotating, on, on annotating yet. Um, and I've given you the link with the um, advice that we give depositors normally. It's all part of that um, section on the website that I showed you in the beginning. <coughs> uh, any questions about annotation files? You're not going to work on any annotation files for this after just just organizing your WAV files, okay. I won't ask anymore. Text files, uh, very, very st standard and stable at the moment. Uh, so preservation or archives preference is for plain text files. Uh, UTF-8 encoding is very important. 
Uh, because, uh, especially when it comes to multilingual content, you need to make sure that when you open it into different systems, you can still read it and that the characters do not break. Um, um, of course, uh, ELAN or transcriber or HTML files are also types of uh, output that we can um, uh, read quite easily. So you can get text file in HTML format. Avoid Word documents if you can. Or you can use it as your working format, so you can type in Word, but when you create the preservation copy that you want to share with other people, make sure you create uh, either a dot, um, .txt or a dot .pdf a version of that if formatting is important. Uh, again, again, make sure that the encoding is the right encoding. Um, if you plan, if you intend to uh, save your um, text documents as HTMLs, uh, do not export from Word because when you open this up uh, into an HTML editor, then it's all got loads of junk in it that you don't really want to um, have um, when you're looking at that as an object that you archive. So best to copy and paste or save as .txt or save as a, as a PDF. At the mo I think that if you have Word 2010, it saves as a PDFA if you select in the settings. So it's fairly straightforward and standard nowadays. Questions? Uh, images. Uh, again, make sure you include your best pictures that show something meaningful and not just a dump of your digital camera. Um, so there, there is a process of selecting the, the ones that are relevant and the ones that are good. Um, and make sure, of course, like all the rest of the data, you include metadata with them. And um, um, they, they, the, any relationships to other sessions or other files are explicit as well. Um, images. So, of course, yes. So, uh, the last point is that perhaps uh, a picture is a thousand words as well as a picture is a thousand minutes of video in the sense that uh, it might be easy to demonstrate something by taking a picture of it, snapshot rather than videoing. And, of course, it will depend on the circumstance, it will depend on what you want to depict, but do not undervalue the importance of taking a nice picture or even a diagram in some, in some fields. Uh, so, plants animals, you know, maybe it's not the particular animal, the particular plant you want to take a picture of, it's the prototypical images of that particular plant, so maybe a diagram is a better way of showing what you mean. Um, and of course anything you have, maps, scans, um, images, uh, consider archiving them if you have the right permissions to do so. Which get me, gets me very nicely to, I've talked about that, um, oh yes, in terms, in, in a technical note, um, use optical, not digital zoom, um, because digital zoom won't, well, it's much better than it used to be, but uh, still, it's best to use uh, your maximum optical zoom and then crop the picture or um, do something with the picture rather than zoom, use the digital zoom and sort of um, pixelize it. And um, here is a point um, that is another inquiry, another question that we have recently got with respect to including scans of manuscripts or scans of books, unpublished or out of print books that people have found or come across into their journeys. So um, if that happens to you, uh, then there are certain things you need to be aware of. Um, so photos or scans, bless you, photos or scans of unpublished or published material manuscripts and photos of participants are all very useful and very important if you have the right permissions to archive them with an archive. So if it is a book that you're digitizing, make sure it's a published book, make sure you have the permission from the publisher. Uh, if it is a manuscript, make sure you have the right permissions from the author. Uh, if it's pictures of people that you want to archive, make sure you have the right permissions for that. Um, make them aware of how you're going to use it because the archive won't be able to accept it even though it's very, very valuable and it might be the only instance of that 
book unless that, that copyright is, is, is clear, that, that, that information is available. Excuse me for a second. So I've included some links um, that you might find useful in your um, research about uh, different copyright laws and what constitutes um, intellectual property in different countries because laws are different. If you if you happen to have to 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 be to have, to come across something like that, to have to make a decision, consult with your archive. And nowadays, if you are in a UK university, usually there is um, um, a service, uh, there's a person who's responsible for information, the information compliance person. So check with, with that in, in, in the, I mean, if you are SOAS, with SOAS, if you are other places, check with other places where you are. Um, and that's a note and kind of um, like a hint or tip to all of you. Uh, go into the menus of all the software you will be using and explore the export and import options and see how and how much you can export and how, how, how many of these software allow you to export into preservation friendly, for, friendly formats. Um, and also something I'm going to go to talk a little bit about is how easy it is to set up a, a backups. So some software might will make a, a backup of your latest changes. So um, Elan will make create a .eaf.001001 file, which is the backup of your previous change. So explore all these different possibilities and options because um, it's good to know that they are there. Um, I have got some notes about character encoding, but I don't have time to go into it. So if you have any questions, ask Peter, me, or David. Um, it's just information about what it is all about and some um, ways of checking and some software to use to check whether something is UTF-8 or not. Um, you know about all this, hopefully, right? But I want, uh, want you to, if there's one picture of this session to remember about metadata, is this. Um, what could you tell me about this picture? Have I shown this to you before? Good. Right. Anyone ha has any idea what this could be? It's data. Ah. Uh, um, hold on, I'll try. No, 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 fair enough, I'll try. Let me try and get rid of this. Is that some letters there, like little tables? So, um, it's a sequence, so you have all the zeros in the on the first line, all the ones, the twos. Let me try and see if I can make it bigger. It's a punch card, yes, yes, well done. It is, a, it is a, a new version of punch card because there were older versions of punch, punch cards with bytes, zero and one, zero and one. But that's a new version of punch card, much like if you ever had, um, if you've ever taken a multiple choice test that's computerized, where you, you do A, B, C, D, or one, two, three, four, it's very similar in that sense, where you black out. In this case, you punch the letter. So this is um, data. This is questionnaire answers of somebody. So somebody was given a questionnaire with um, um, seven um, from a range zero, zero to, to nine, is it? Yeah. So you can see the number of questions here and what, what people put as their answer. So... Um, what are the, okay, I'll show you the next picture and then perhaps we can consider the issues together. So that's this. That's the other one. What could that be? It's a tape, yeah. Recorded on a Wednesday? Maybe. Oh, about a Wednesday. About a Wednesday. By Wednesday. Oh, by somebody called Wednesday. Very good. <laughs> Wonderful. And the last one, 
that might that's a m more recent example so these are ob obviously file names right um, what can you tell me about these four files it looks like it's exactly it looks like my assignment files as well and loads of my presentations actually Final draft, final, final. <laughs> so that that brings. Oops, that was too close. Sorry. That brings that brings you to the question of versioning and how you will need to manage your versions, especially when you're working in a group, right? So, what are the things that would have made our life much easier? What if that? So, what what what's the missing missing information? What's the missing? What would have helped us understand? what this data is all about. Metadata. Um, I'm grateful that Nadia knows everything because no one else says anything. I'm not, it's not for you, Nadia. It's, 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 it's kind of, please help me. No, that's all right. No, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was complete, the complete opposite. It wasn't meant to be. Thank you, thank you for answering. That's the, that was the. Uh, so, of course, metadata and also um, uh, brings up questions about labeling uh, and how clear a labeling is and um, the importance of semantic labeling, perhaps, or the unimportance of semantic labeling. Um, another issue is um, punch cards. Do you think we would be able to process this data nowadays? When you said this is, new, this is a new version, how... Oh, it was zero and ones, and that's how you would do, like, bytes. No, but what, when you say it's a new version, what, what year is it exactly? Roughly, uh, I don't know. Okay, it's, it's, I think it should be 60s or 70s. Oh, so that's the latest. So, so it's, it's fairly, well, it's, it's not new, but it's fairly, it's fairly, I've seen older versions of that. Um, so, um... We can't exactly. We, have, we need a key. We need to know what the questions were. We also might need some some machinery to go through to be able to uh, make that or go through that. Um, same goes with the tape. And that's why I've I've brought the old play play players here, uh, tape machines, so that we can play um, some old media. Um, but I mean, to me. As these these two aside, the, this is an unacceptable way of, of having your, your data, or your file naming. So unacceptable in the sense that you, you will cr drive you crazy because if you need to create a fifth version of that, how will you, are you going to name it? A s final one. File, <laughs> real version. Which one is the real? Which one is, is the, is, is the non-real version? Which one is the fictional? Um, so, um, so versioning like something, adding something concrete to that file, such as a date or a time. Um, also initials by the person who last edited it, or these are different ways of, of doing versioning on a file. Also folders can help you put things in a structure, or you can even have a spreadsheet and record that information there. So, um, so you know all about that and what uh, endangered language documentation should include, so I won't go into it. Um, two more pictures. One is this. I've got ten minutes, or do I have to stop now? I've got five minutes. Okay, I'll go through my pictures very quickly. So that is, I'm sorry, but we had to blow up your laptop, and it highlights the importance of having loads of backups in loads of places. Um, this is from an actual example, like field work happening, uh, not linguistic field work but other type of free work. So that's the source. So you can go and have a look at her blog and see what it was all about. Um, other examples. Uh, you have your data in a data center or in your universities, computing servers. Something happens that they catch fire, and that's your only copy. Now you're hoping that they've made the, they've got a preservation plan and backup the pack up back up their servers but uh, you should never rely on one location only you should always make multiple copies of your data and store it somewhere um, 
and I've got some points um, about a risk of loss, um, thinking about whether your data will survive a disaster, protect it against not simply fires or bull bullets, but also damage as in your USB falling on the floor or falling on the floor and breaking or um, being washed with your trousers in your washing machine. Simple things like that that can happen to anyone rather than the scenarios I just offered you. Um, and um, of course what I said is important that you have a strategy rather than randomly backing up things in random places. It is very important that you agree and document what you're going to do. Um, and here are some issues to think about. And nowadays, it doesn't have to be a very expensive process. It doesn't have to be even in the cloud. It could simply be an, off, an offline uh, hard drive that you, you buy and have somewhere. Um, and, and you give it to your mom to put it somewhere safe, or give it to somebody else in your family and have another one here, or have another one elsewhere. Um, other problems with respect to data uh, is when your media becomes corrupt, so you need to be aware of that as well. So it's one of the advantages of having multiple media and multiple locations. And just to make you aware that uh, CDs and DVDs are the ones that deteriorate, deteriorate um, um, like uh, easily, degrading quite easily compared to SD cards and uh, flash drives and other hard drives, etc. Um, and I'll leave this up to you. And here's another picture. And that's my last picture, I think. So, and here is another one. So, um, somebody uh, once um, said that endangered language documentation is very much like medical data sometimes. Uh, so some of parts of the data that you record are uh, rituals that might be secret, sacred rituals that only particular people can, will ha can see. So it's up to you to make sure that you have the right things in place when it comes to protecting your data from unauthorized access and uh, making sure that uh, your computer is not accessed by everybody at any point. So you leave your computer lying on in the library and somebody steals your laptop. So there goes all your data. So have you set up password? No, yes. So things to consider and think early on uh, while working with your data. And if you need encryption, come and find me at the archive. Uh, if you don't know what encryption is, again, come and find me at the archive. Uh, it's a way to um, store your data so that not everybody can immediately look at it. So it's a way to hide your data or scr uh, scramble your data so that not, not, somebody cannot straightforwardly open them unless they have the key or the password. And I think I'll finish on that note. Sorry, that's the last picture. Um, so I'll finish on that note and are there any questions? Um, You've got sufficiently scared, I think. So. Sorry, <laughs> I found that these pictures are always a good way, a way to rem for think for you to remember things rather than uh, because bullet points get lost. Will you send this out? Yes, yes, oh. yeah. Okay, so let's sing. Thank you very much.